I want to focus your attention this morning on Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read the first two verses. Uh, We are beginning a new series this morning through the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter. It's six chapters long, and I'm really, really looking forward to walking through this letter with you. And this morning, I want to focus on just the first two verses, Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul introduces himself as the author of this letter and simply says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. God, as we begin this journey through the book of Ephesians, I pray that you would be the one who convinces our hearts and our minds of the glorious truth that is in these pages. My opinions, my thoughts, even my convictions can't do one thing to meet people where they are this morning. That's your job. Only you can do that. And so I pray that through this fallible, fallen preacher, you will be the voice that we hear. That you would speak loudly and clearly and compellingly and convincingly. That you would reveal yourself to us. And as a result of revealing yourself to us, we would leave here today feeling lighter, liberated, set free. So we've already sung it, but now we pray with one voice, come thou fount of every blessing. And tune our hearts and our minds to see and to savor your amazing grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're starting this new series, and I want to I want to begin with this quote. It's by my favorite writer who I've peddled to you on numerous occasions, who is now dead by the name of Robert Capon. He said this, if we are ever going to experience the glorious liberty that God wants us to experience, we're going to have to spend more time thinking about freedom. The church has had a poor record of encouraging freedom. It has spent so much time instilling us with the fear of making mistakes that it has made us like ill-taught piano students. We play our pieces, but we never hear the tune because our main concern is not to make music, but to avoid some flub that will get us in trouble. The church, having put itself in parent mode, has been so afraid we will lose sight of the need to do it right that it has made us care more about how we look than enjoying the freedom Jesus paid so dearly to secure for us. It has made us act more like subjects of a police state than fellow citizens of the saints. I think he's right. I think he's exactly right. And Ephesians, like every other book in the Bible, was written to set us free. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of everything God gives us from Genesis to Revelation. It is in service to Jesus' own mission, which he gives us in Luke chapter 4, when he says, I have come to set the captives free. That is Jesus' personal mission statement. And the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the written word, in other words, corresponds to the, 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 the mission of the written word, corresponds to the mission of the living word, namely Jesus. So everything that we find in the Bible has as its purpose, its mission, to set us free and Ephesians is no different. I titled the series, But God, because those two words together not only capture the main theme of Ephesians, but the main theme of Christianity as a whole. In Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read the first four verses. Paul writes, and we'll get to this in a few weeks, but Paul writes, and you, speaking to all of us, 
And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, in other words, we came into this world, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, that is a very, very bleak diagnosis, okay? Very bleak diagnosis of humankind, that we all come into this world dead in our trespasses and sins. We don't come into this world morally neutral. We don't come into this world innocent. We don't come into this world good. People try to, um, people try to confront that assumption, uh, that diagnosis of the Bible by saying, but I mean, look at, look at little babies. How in the world can you say that a little baby doesn't come into this world innocent and good? Anybody who says that has never had a little baby, okay? Think about how unbearably selfish little babies are. They will scream at 3 o'clock in the morning. They don't care if you're sleeping. They don't care if you're sound asleep. They want their food, and they want it now, and they don't care who they're disrupting. You tell a toddler not to do something, it becomes that toddler's mission to do the very thing you told it not to do. So don't give me this, children are innocent, and they're not, okay? They're little vipers, all right? And if you're a parent, you know that to be true. They're cute, and they're adorable, and I have loved all all of my children when they were small especially and my grandchildren love them all but don't try to tell me that they're they come into this world innocent they're not and paul says that so he paints this bleak picture of humankind and then he says in verse 4 but god being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, but God, the title of the series comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. My friend Sally Lloyd-Jones who wrote an amazing children's storybook Bible called the Jesus Storybook Bible, which I have highly recommended on numerous occasions, not just for kids, but for adults. She says this, but God, those two little words are the most important in the whole Bible. They show up 3,930 times. When everything looks like it's over, when there's no hope, but God. God does something. He turns everything all around. Those words are like a fire engine rounding the bend. Help is on the way. Adam and Eve left the garden, but God whispered a promise to them. A flood was coming, but God came to Noah. We were helpless, but God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus. I'm I'm sure that we could all give our own personal examples of but God moments. I know I can. I can give you plenty of examples of but God moments. God and the upside down nature of his grace contradicts everything that makes sense to us. Everything. We think that things are going a certain way and God shows up. God does something. But God, when things look bleak, when things look hopeless, when things look like they will never, ever get better, that they'll never, ever turn around, but God. All the time. We see that not only throughout the Bible, but we see it in our own lives. There are ways that we naturally assume our relationship with God and others works. And yet Ephesians, and we'll see this as we make our way through it, Ephesians confronts our assumptions at every level and turns them upside down with the words, but God. And what we see again and again throughout this letter is that God meets our messes with his mercy. He meets our failures with his forgiveness. He meets our badness with his goodness. He meets our guilt with his grace over and over and over again. Now, I read the first two verses because I really want us to focus on verse two. 
in all of Paul's letters, and you can go back and look at this, in all of Paul's letters, he always begins, it was the way they wrote letters back in the day, they don't tell you who's writing the letter at the end like we do, they would tell you who's writing the letter at the beginning. So Paul introduces himself in verse 1, and then he says, grace to you and peace to you. And we typically read right past those verses or a verse like that when we get to them because we think they're just sort of a formal introductory sentence. But in reality, it's so much more than that. Um, In Paul, in all of his letters, he gives us the essence of the gospel right at the beginning. He always begins with the gospel right at the beginning by using the words grace and peace. And it's so much more than a formal greeting for him. These two words really sum up the essence of the gospel, grace and peace. So I want to look at them briefly. By way of introduction to this letter, I want to look at those two words, grace and peace. Grace, we can say, is the root of the gospel, and peace, you could say, is the fruit of the gospel, okay? Root and fruit. Um, For Paul, grace is not an abstract concept. Grace is Jesus, It's not some theological category. That's the way we typically treat it. Uh, Grace is Jesus who gave himself for sinners. Grace is personified in, in the person and work of Jesus. According to Paul, grace is very personal because it's embodied in Jesus. Grace is, according to Paul, reckless love that runs after rebels. Grace is love coming to you that has nothing to do with you. Grace has everything to do with the indiscriminate compassion of the lover. It has nothing to do with whether the loved one deserves it. In fact, what makes grace grace is that the loved one, the one who receives love, doesn't deserve it. So grace has this love coming to you that has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the indiscriminate compassion of the lover. Grace, in other words, doesn't make demands. It just gives And from our vantage point, it always gives to the wrong people. Always. We see this repeatedly in the Gospels, repeatedly. Jesus is always friendly and forgiving to the wrong people. Always. That's what got him in so much trouble with the religious people. He was always friendly and he was always forgiving and he was always welcoming and kind to the wrong people. He wasn't friendly and forgiving to the good people. He was friendly and forgiving to the bad people didn't make sense. His stories in the Gospels consistently featured spiritual losers as the heroes of the story. Every time. Uh, The bad prodigal son, not the responsible good son. Uh, The prostitute, not the Pharisee. Those who broke the rules on the Sabbath, not those who kept them. He was always uh, befriending the rule breakers. And he was always uh, confronting the rule keepers. Always. Doesn't make sense. I'm convinced that if Jesus went through membership classes at 99.9% of the churches in the world today, he wouldn't be accepted. Okay. Um, I mean, the most extravagant sinners of Jesus' day received his most empathetic welcome. It's frustrating when you think about it. Okay. I mean, we read the stories and we think, isn't Jesus nice? Isn't he sweet? He's always coming alongside the guilty and the bad and the underdog. And he's, he's sweet. He's very kind. He's meek and he's mild. And we like that. But when God gives grace to the people that we are holding a grudge against, when God gives grace and when God forgives the people we just can't forgive because they've hurt us too bad, I mean, we're, we're all about believing in grace when it's given to the victim. But what about believing in grace when it's also distributed to the oppressor? Okay. So grace rubs us the wrong way in lots of different ways, the same way it rubbed the religious leaders the wrong way in Jesus' day. Um, unlike our current cancel culture, Jesus was unwilling to cancel the worst of the worst, the baddest of the bad, and the guiltiest of the guilty. Oh, the establishment wanted him to, but he refused to do it. He befriended, loved, and touched the outcast, 
the misfit, the leper, the liar, the sexually deviant. He befriended those people. He welcomed those people. He loved those people. Um, He refused to reject those who had been rejected. And he refused to denounce those who had been denounced. Refused. This is grace in practice. There's one kind of canceling, however, that Jesus was all about. Colossians 2.14, which goes down as one of my top five favorite verses in the Bible, says this. It is the gospel in a verse. He, namely Jesus, forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away. Nailing it to the cross. That's the gospel. Maybe this is the reason why Jesus himself was canceled by his culture. And canceled by ours. You see, the the scandal of Jesus' promiscuous love toward the unlovely is just too vulgar for a culture that must find some consolation in dealing with the uncomfortable log in their own eye by pointing out the speck in someone else's. I have a friend named Nadia who said, I think our drug of choice these days is having to think we're better than someone. I think she's right. That's the big difference between Jesus and cancel culture. While our culture cancels people who have done terrible things, Jesus cancels the terrible things that people are canceled for. Huge difference. Well, that's, that's the kind of grace, the kind of radical grace that Paul introduces us to at the very beginning of this letter. In this sense... Grace is a divine vulgarity that stands caution on its head. It it refuses, grace refuses to give gold stars to the religiously well-behaved. Refuses. In fact, grace is opposed to what is earned. It's opposed to merit. It's opposed to deservedness. Grace upends the religious apple cart and says, the bad get the best... The worst inherit the wealth, the whore becomes a bride, and the slave becomes a son. I mean, that sounds poetic, but it also grates us. Yeah, but, well, what about, I, in some of your minds right now, I, yes, but that, that needs to be nuanced a little, but there needs to be a footnote on the, <laughs> let me tell you where yes, grace, but, dot, 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 originated in the Garden of Eden, in the mouth of the devil. Yes, grace, but doesn't come from God. It comes from the devil. It comes from the enemy. Our flesh is so naturally resistant to it is finished that we will develop grand theological constructs to try to come up with some caveat that puts a condition on God's grace. God doesn't let us do it. You see, grace is a liberating contradiction between what we deserve and what we get. Grace is the ultimate but God. The ultimate. I mean, I just read it in Ephesians chapter 2. Things were bad. We were undeserving We were not doing good things. We were born doing bad things. We were born rebels. Not born, as I said, morally neutral. We were born, Paul says, at enmity with God. We weren't uh, neutral when it came to God. We were at enmity with God. And what does God do about it? makes us alive, but God, being rich in mercy, makes us alive together with Christ. Grace is the ultimate but God. Grace is the the core of the gospel. Grace is the root of the gospel, according to Paul, which is why 
he opens up with it in every letter that he writes. He wants us to be clear and he wants us to be focused right at the beginning. He wants us to know what this is going to be about. The end of the day, this is what it's going to be about. And he wants us to know that. He puts all of his cards on the table right at the beginning. So for Paul, grace is, is the root of the gospel. But for Paul, peace is the fruit of the gospel. The Bible identifies two different types of peace. Okay, there's, there's peace with God, and then there's the peace of God. Two different kinds of peace. Both are really important, and both are absolutely necessary. Peace with God, or what I like to call objective peace, peace outside of us, okay, Peace with God comes to us because of Jesus settling the score on our behalf. Because of what Jesus has done for us, outside of us, we have peace with God. The war between God and me is over because of Jesus' work for me. Okay, that's peace with God. There has been a, a ceasefire between God and me. And be, because of what Jesus has done on my behalf, the war between God and me is over. I now have peace with God. I've, the Bible uses other words like we have been reconciled. We've been adopted. A bunch of beautiful words the Bible gives us to illustrate the fact that we have peace with God. The peace of God, or what I like to call subjective peace, internal peace, is the experience of the peace that Jesus secured for us. In other words, you could put it this way, peace with God is a fact, whether you feel it or not, but peace, the peace of God is a feeling. It's our apprehension of the external truth that God has made peace with us in the person and work of Jesus. Now, peace with God never fluctuates, okay? It's a done deal. We have been forever freed, forever. Jesus said it is finished, and that means that we now have peace with God both here and throughout eternity. The war is over. It never fluctuates. I say it week in and week out. There's nothing you can do or fail to do that will ever cause God to leave you or forsake you or abandon you or stop loving you because God's love for you is not dependent on what you do or don't do. It's dependent entirely and exclusively on what Jesus has done for you. So peace with God never fluctuates, okay? Um, it's a done deal. Uh, the peace of God, however, can and often does fluctuate. The second we say, yes, grace, but, the peace of God begins to waver because now we're taking our eyes off of Jesus and fixing our eyes on ourselves. We're taking our eyes off of his work for us and we're focusing on our work for him or our work for ourselves. And the moment we do that, the peace of God, which naturally flows from peace with God, begins to fluctuate. Our attention shifts from Jesus and what he's done to me and, and what I must do and I start to get anxious, I start to get tense, I start to get stressed. I lose peace because now the burden is on me to make life work. I got to make things happen. I, I, I got to ensure things don't get broken. I got to make sure everybody in my life is taken care of. I, I got to make sure that the right results come my way. And that means that I have to do the right things. And I have to make sure that professionally and personally and spiritually, I've got to dot my I's and cross my T's. It's all on me to make life work. It's all on me to make things happen. It's on me to secure for myself the love and acceptance and value and significance that I crave. I got to go out and get it. I have to extract it from my work. I have to extract it from my relationships. It's on me to make life work. Well, as soon as that happens, when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we put our eyes back, on ourselves, the, the peace of God begins to waver. Or you could put it this way, wherever unbelief is present, the peace of God is absent. Okay, so wherever I'm failing to believe that everything I need 
in Christ I already possess, wherever I'm failing to believe that, those, as one writer puts it, those unevangelized territories of my heart, wherever that is, and we all have it, wherever unbelief is present, the peace of God is absent. I've, um, I've shared this with you guys, but for, this fall was uh, August, September, parts of October were rough for me. They were rough. I'm, I'm sure they were rough for you guys too in a variety of different ways. But they were rough for me specifically as it pertained to this church. I mentioned months ago that August and September were, were rough months for our church. Um, we always expect summer to be slow. Every church expects summer to be slow in every imaginable way. But usually things pick back up. Uh, you know, once the kids go back to school and and people come back to town after being on vacation and the school year begins. But for whatever reason, I'm sure there are a whole host of reasons, but for whatever reason, uh, the sanctuary didn't really bounce back from its summer lull when I thought it would, both financially and in other ways. And I was worried to be honest with you. I mean, I, I was worried. I mean, Stacy and I uh, have really, in so many different ways, committed everything we have to the work here, and we're excited about it, and we're enthusiastic about it, and, and we've, we've grown, as I've mentioned, we've, we've grown to not only love, but to appreciate you as family. We, we moved here in part because we needed to be part of a family. We wanted to be part of a family. Whatever family God was going to assemble, we wanted to be a part of it. And so we came here and, and we've worked here and we've been with many of you now for close to three years and, and we've walked with each other and we have lived life with one another. And for whatever reason, it sort of scared me based on the long lull that we experienced that this church may not make it. I mean, we're young. I mean, we, we, we planted a church at the worst time in history to plant a church, like six months before the entire world shut down, okay? So I was, when we were all shut, we, you know, we were a church for six months and then we were shut down for eight months. So we were shut down longer than we were a church and we didn't know if we were gonna come out of this thing with, any, with a church, and we did, and, and we kind of expected things to bounce back fast and quick, and, and it, just, it just didn't. And I was scared. I, I mean, I, I've shared this with you guys. Um, I was scared. I was, I was beginning to think that maybe this isn't going to make it, and maybe Stacy and I are going to have to start from scratch somewhere else. We're going to have to do something else. Maybe God's calling us somewhere else. And I, and I just, I found myself, this is going to sound... Um, a little melodramatic, but I found myself at different times driving in my car and passing certain things on the road, places that I typically go, restaurants we go to, uh, places that we frequent, and just getting really upset because I thought our whole life's going to change soon. I mean, that's really where my mind went. I was, I was scared. I was nervous. Um, I, uh, I was anxious. I needed peace, and I found myself begging God for peace. I was battling unbelief in my own heart. I was battling unbelief, and, and where I was battling unbelief, where my unbelief was present, the peace of God was absent. And so I, I was able to make that connection, and I found myself begging God for peace. The source of my lack of peace was that there was nothing that I could do to fix things. You know, the situation was completely out of my control. There's only so much you can do. Um, my anxiety was stoked by my inability to do anything about the circumstances. I mean, what would happen to me? What would happen to others if this church didn't make it? That's where, I, that's where my head was. Um, and then I flipped over to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, verses that I visit regularly. Um, in fact, I'll read them to you. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, verses that are probably familiar to some of you. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. That alone makes me anxious, <laughs> doesn't it? I'm like, now I'm already anxious that I'm anxious. Thanks a lot, Paul. You know, good friend and help you are. But he gets to the good news. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Dump it all on God. Bring it all to God. We had a board meeting in September where I was on the receiving end of bad financial news um, about the church. And that night, uh, or the next night, um, Stacy was uh, with her small group of, of ladies, uh, and I took Jenna, my daughter, out to dinner. And I was um, noticeably not talkative, okay, to Jenna, and kind of looking distracted. And she asked me, she said, uh, what, well, like, what's going on? I said, I just, I'm, I'm really distracted right now, and there's something bothering me. So I told her, what, she said, well, what is it? So I told her what it was. And she said, well, have you prayed about it? <laughs> this is coming from my 20-year-old daughter, okay? She said, well, have you prayed about it? And I, I looked at her and I said, you know, I, I don't think I have. Honestly, in the last 24 hours, I said, I don't, I don't think I have. And she looked at me and said, things, said some things to me that I had said to her from the moment she came into this world. And she was now repeating them back to me. That is such a gift from God. When the seeds that you plant in your children come back to feed you at some point. And uh, she looked at me and she said, Dad, I, you know the year I had last year. It was rough and I was lonely and I was depressed. And, and I just, I found myself praying and asking God to take it. And it's amazing that every time I would pray, God would bring immediate relief to me. Even if it was fleeting and temporary. It was like the reminder that I needed that he was in charge. And I'm telling you, I mean, this sounds, you know, I, I'm a educated, seminary trained man who's been doing this for a long time. And it took the words of my 20 year old daughter to remind me to pray when things are scary. And they were. And then Paul goes on to say, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then what happens when you do that? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I went back to those verses over and over and over again. Um, and through those verses, God gently reminded me, I've got this. I've got you. I'll never leave you. I'll always take care of you. I love loving you. Relax. I've got this. Well, my, the peace with God never fluctuated during that season. And I could tell you about a thousand other seasons in my life where the peace of God has wavered, has fluctuated because I was trying to make things happen on my own or trying to fix things on my own or trying to manage things on my own or trying to manufacture outcomes on my own or whatever else I thought I needed that I thought I could achieve on my own. So I could give you a thousand different examples. Um, but this was the one where through those verses in particular, God's like, I don't need to tell you how this is gonna turn out. You just need to know that I got you. I got you. No matter what, come hell or high water, I got you. You're mine. I paid for you. You belong to me. I love loving you. It is not a burden to me to love you. I love to do it. You're my child. You're my son. I've got you. When the, you know, when the God of the universe says that, I mean, I, I can tell you how much comfort I used to experience when my dad would remind, even as a grown man, when I would get worried about things. And my dad was the, always the first person I would go to, always. I mean, he was just wisdom personified. He was a psychologist, but he wasn't a psychologist that made you feel like you were being analyzed. You know, he just, he was a psychologist because he loved people. And he knew people. And I would make a beeline for him every time I was anxious. 
Every time I was worried about something, every time I was confused, every time I was scared, every time there was a big decision on the horizon that I wasn't sure what to do, I would go to my dad. And five minutes of talking to him and him talking to me made me feel it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. It's all going to turn out okay. Well, I felt that from my earthly dad, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that a lot of my friends and people that I know have never felt that from their earthly dad. But I'll tell you what, whether you had a dad that you could rely on or a dad you couldn't rely on, God has promised to be our dad here and now. And if I felt that much comfort going to my earthly father, when God comes to me and I'm scared and I'm anxious and I'm worried and I don't know how things are going to go and uh, I, can't seem to, I can't seem to be making things happen the way that I used to and so on and so forth, going to God and hearing him say, I got you. Didn't I promise you? I, I told you, look at the lilies of the field, how beautifully they're dressed. Why do you worry about what you're going to wear tomorrow? Why do you worry about whether or not you're going to have something to eat or a roof over your head or, or people in your life to show you my love for you? I mean, I've got you. I've got this. When you're on the brink of despair, faith in yourself will bring you no peace at all. Okay, you've tried. I've tried. You know how it goes. The peace you long for when everything seems to be falling apart won't come from believing more deeply in yourself and your ability to fix things. It's not where it's going to come from. It will only come by believing more deeply in the one who promises to love us and take care of us in all of our unfixedness. God never promises to give us answers to all of our questions. In fact, when we're done with this, we're going to look at the book of Job, most likely, although I reserve the right to change my mind. So don't come to me if I choose not to preach through Job and say, but you promised. I'm not promising you anything. I'm suggesting that possibly... We will look at the book of Job when we're done with Ephesians. I like to go Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, and in Job, as you know, perhaps uh, he suffers catastrophic losses. Catastrophic losses. And he and his friends begin questioning God and whether God knows what he's doing and, and all of that stuff. And God just listens. He listens. For 38 chapters, he listens to these idiots go back and forth and wax eloquent about things they don't know. They're leveling charges at God and, and saying that God isn't really sure what he's doing and how can we believe that God is both good and in control and so many bad things happen and they're speculating. And God listens and listens and listens. And then in chapter 38, after 30 some odd chapters of patiently listening, God breaks the silence and says, Job, you have questioned me. Now brace yourself like a man because I'm getting ready to question you. And he says things like, where were you when I was laying the earth's foundations? Where were you when I was telling the lightning where to strike and the thunder where to roll? Where were you when I was creating sea creatures that no human eye will ever see? I created them just so that I would be entertained by it. And he begins, he begins showing Job that he is speculating way beyond his pay grade. And ironically, God never ever says to Job, ever, Job, listen, you've gone through a lot, and I'm sorry you've gone through a lot. There's a reason you've gone through a lot. Let me tell you why I allowed the suffering in your life that I allowed. He never did it. God's answer to all of Job's why questions was simply to reveal who he was, who God was. We ask why, 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 why? And God says, I am God. Trust me. And Job, after hearing those comforting words from God, says, before my ears had heard of you, 
but now my eyes have seen you. Well, that's, that's the peace of God. That's the peace of God. When we stop trusting in ourselves and believing in ourselves and our own strength and our own ability to make things happen, to change our spouse, to fix our kids, to get enough money in the bank so we can retire on time and blah, blah, blah. When we trust God for those things, we experience the peace of God which transcends all understanding. And it guards our hearts and our minds. So the peace you long for when everything seems to be falling apart will not come from believing more deeply in yourself or in your ability to to fix things. It only comes by believing more deeply in the one who promises to love you in the middle of all of your unfixedness. Or as Henry Durbinville said, we haven't been promised a smooth journey, only a safe arrival. And elsewhere, Psalm 23 in particular, what does David say? You will walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't say you will rescue me. He says you'll walk with me through it. We'll never be alone. We'll never be abandoned. That truth, because of grace, the root of the gospel, the fruit of the gospel, peace, the peace of God which transcends all understanding can be our experience. Um, I, uh, I'm going to read something to you in a moment, but I need to preface it. I've asked, I sent Daniel a picture yesterday and said, can you put this on the screen when I sort of cue you up? Uh, before you, okay, that's fine. You can keep it. <laughs> now, um, I, I want to explain this for a minute. The, the, the point that I want to make doesn't have the same effect without you seeing the picture. Um, I didn't pose for this. This was not a pose. This was kind of a surprise look on my face. Um, it was taken, this picture was taken in the spring of 2018 at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. It was uh, Stacy's first trip to New York, and I wanted her to see it. And so I was sitting there quietly by myself when Stacy, who had been walking around and taking pictures, snapped this photo. Uh, I just happened to glance at her right as she did. I didn't pose for this. But this picture means a lot to me. I want to tell you why. I wrote this about a year ago. Every time I see this photo, I'm reminded of how sad I was during that season of my life. I had wrecked my life three years earlier and had lost everything. I was still reeling from the internal and external consequences of my own screw-up. I was convinced that my best days were behind me, that I'd never be as happy as I used to be. I lived every day with deep regret, guilt, and shame. I was hopeless most days. I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I was in personal limbo with no signs of light at the end of my very dark tunnel. To be honest, death on most days seemed much more preferable to life. Thankfully, I'm not in that place anymore. To be sure, I still have my moments. I still struggle sometimes with knowing who I am without some of the people and things I had for the first half of my life. And I'm sure that I'll always live with a low degree of sadness because of the ways in which I hurt the people that I loved. But God has brought me to the other side. He has carried me single-handedly through the valley of the shadow of death, and he has restored joy and gladness to my life. These crushed bones are rejoicing again. Now, I, I wish that I could give you some formula for how to get yourself from sadness to joy, but I can't. What I can give you is God's promise that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you, that his goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life and that he will lead you to greener pastures than you can imagine right now. God is interested in you, the you who suffers, the you who inflicts suffering on others, the you who hides, the you who has bad days and good ones. And he meets you where you are 
and he promises to stay with you come hell or high water. He has for me, and he will for you too. But God. Let's pray together.